Good morning. Am I anti-monarchy? Yes. Am I also pro-princess story? Yes. We'll unpack that at another date. Today I am in my bridesmaid's robe from Amazon, my favorite loud earrings, and we're gonna talk about my favorite princess stories from around the world, going beyond the Disney narrative. So the first book I wanna talk about is The Moon Princess, and this was retold by Ralph McCarthy, and the illustrations are by Concho Oda. Now Concho Oda actually was born in the 1800s, and these illustrations are decades old. They were repurposed, as, repurposed excuse me, uh, for the creation of this book and i don't know if you can see the detail in the moon princess's kimono here or the detail in the facial expressions of these japanese princes but it is an absolutely stunning book one of the other things i love about it is that it's bilingual as so it has the japanese text and the english text on every page and you can tell that this was a story not created in the Western canon or rather an American folktale because it doesn't follow the same traditional story structure that I would argue a lot of fairy tales and folktales that we are familiar with follow now. There isn't really a happy ending necessarily, it more of it is what it is. And I feel like one of the best lessons to take from it is that no matter how long your love for someone lasts, no longer how no matter how long you are together, that doesn't make the relationship any less valid. And it may sound like I'm talking about a romantic relationship, but the Moon Princess is actually someone who was sent to Earth away from the city of the moon because they were being threatened by a great dragon during a war. And she was actually raised over the period of four years, and four years she went from an infant to a grown, beautiful woman, by an elderly couple that had never had children, a bamboo cutter and his wife, and they loved her and adored her, and she chose to stay with them even when all these wealthy um, powerful princes wanted to come and marry her. My only criticism of this book is the translation which might be odd for me to say because I do not read Japanese but this entire story the English part, part is written in verse however the verse isn't consistent. Sometimes it's stanzas, sometimes it's couplets, sometimes sentences are broken up in very strange ways, like the first word of a line on the line previous and the last word of a line on the line after in order to make it kind of rhyme. And some sections don't rhyme at all. So if you are someone who's familiar with the story or you read or speak Japanese, I would love to know if the original folktale is also supposed to be in verse. Translating work and making it accurate, but also translating work and making it rhyme, I'm sure is incredibly difficult. I'm not trying to knock Ralph McCarthy here, um, it's more of the idea that, that I, I wonder if the original story is in verse and if this translator felt the need to make the English version in verse because so many of our fairy tales and folk tales are written in that way. I almost wish he had made the decision to just write it as a story because every time I tried to get into it, every time I pulled my eyes away from the beautiful illustrations, there were moments where I was like, this feels awkward to read because when you're used to reading something that rhymes, you start to get in like this internal rhythm that kept being broken up by the shifts and the phrasing and the grammar. So while I do think this is a beautiful book, I love the idea of having more works that are in multiple languages. And again, the illustrations, like I actually looked up some of Concha uh, Oda's work after this because I mean, look at me, look at the movement in this painting of the ship on the high seas in a storm. Like, it's just absolutely gorgeous. I just, I had a, some concerns, some uh, issues with the translation, but overall, I still think it is a beautiful story. Moving away from Japan, we are gonna go to Persia for the Persian Cinderella, uh, retold by Shirley Klimo, art by Robert Florzak. Now, my criticism of this book is gonna come early, and it's one of the few criticisms, the title. The Cinderella story as we know it, the story of a young woman who either has lost one parent or both parents, who lives a life lacking in resources, lacking in love, finds magic, whether it's through a fairy godmother, through a potty, uh, through her mother's ghost, through a bird sent down by the uh, Egyptian god Ra, finds a way to go to a royal event all dressed up and beautiful, loses an item, sometimes a shoe, in this story it's a, it's a diamond anklet, falls in love with a royal prince, and then is reunited with the prince through the reuniting of this girl with her item. That story is thousands of years old. Every single culture has a story like that. I'm pretty sure the oldest one is actually an Egyptian story named Rodophis or Rodophis. I'll put it up on the screen. But the reason this bothers me is because it feels like a marketing decision. This book is written in English. It was uh, produced in America. So I understand that for Americans, we are most familiar with the story of Cinderella. And that 
is how we're looking at the, that's how we're looking at all stories that fit that motif. But this isn't the Persian Cinderella. This is a retelling of the anklet, which is a story found in the Arabian Nights uh, anthology. So I almost wish they had named it like the anklet, a Persian Cinderella story, because we are familiar with Cinderella adaptations, but I don't like the idea, or at least the impression that I got, that this is just dipping a European story in Persian flavor or something when this is actually its own independent retelling of a story that has a lot of similarities to the European Cinderella story that we know now. A Probably a tiny gripe because I do really enjoy the story, but I feel like this was marketing. One thing I really love about this book is if you go to the very end, you'll see in the uh, author's note that the Persian community of Los Angeles provided models for the book's characters. And I find that so, so cool um, because I love the idea of a modern community getting to be involved and getting to have their likeness used as inspiration for characters in a retelling of this ancient story. So in this version of the story, as opposed to there being a fairy godmother, there is a potty, which I read is a basically like a Persian fairy or a Persian magical being in a small blue pot that our main character uh, finds. And that is the one who helps her get clothes for the ball, who uh, gifts her with beautiful diamond anklets as opposed to slippers. And one of those anklets is what she loses when she is running away after a night of festivities and fun. One of my favorite things about this is the illustrations or are the illustrations and the way that you get introduced to a very specific culture. Again, in the framework of a story you may be familiar with. So for example, because the prince per Persian customs is not allowed to be entering into the rooms and homes of women that he's not related to, it's actually his mother who takes the anklet and goes from home to home trying to find people who fit can fit it on their delicate little ankle. And in addition, because this young woman is spending time with her cousins, with her aunts, with her sisters, in the traditional way, like living in the women's quarters, it, the story kind of highlights the fact that she is so lonely and that she is so rejected, even when she's surrounded by all these people. There's all these women around who are supposed to be, you know, her, com her comrades and her friends and her stepsisters, but they still shun her despite all of them living in the women's quarters of the palace. And I don't know, something about a young girl being surrounded by tons of people who are supposed to be her support system but still feeling so alone and being rejected kind of hits me deeper than the idea of the Disney Cinderella where it's really just her, her two stepsisters and her stepmom in that big house all by themselves. Another thing I love about this story is that I love, and you'll see this in some other books I have too, I love that the illustrations vary. So see in this image of the, the ball, what we would call the royal event, the text is in the center and all these beautiful images are around the sides and the top, which kind of gives movement to it. But in other uh, parts of the story, it's more quote unquote traditional in which you have the text at the bottom and the big images on top. And I feel like that adds visual diversity to the book. You know, it makes it more interesting to see the different types of illustrations and the different ways ways that the, the, um, the illustrations move across the page. And I think it helps them fit kind of the message of what's happening. I mean, I love the fact that in this version of the story, she actually is unwillingly turned into a dove on her wedding day by her jealous sisters who want to get rid of her. And this big, beautiful illustration of this small little bird flying away, like I love that this is a page in which the illustration takes precedent over the text. So I really love any story that gets me interested and invested in cultures that I'm not super familiar with. I'm not very familiar with per Persian culture, but this is a really beautiful story. If you were interested in uh, kind of princess stories that follow this theme, I would highly recommend it. And again, I just really love the idea that I am looking at characters that are based on real people, because although these folk tales may have a grain of truth in them, sometimes I think embracing the fact that even if the stories themselves never literally happened, they are incredibly important to communities in terms of storytelling, in terms of passing down lessons. So tying that in, <clears throat> excuse me, tying that in with the fact that all the characters in this book were modeled after real Persian people living in modern times in LA. I don't know, I like the, I like the crossing of generations and the crossing of literally thousands of years. And when you think about Persian folk tales and now in order to make this story.
So moving on to another story that you are familiar with, most likely through the German version, which is that of a little man who helps a woman spin straw into gold. We have The Girl Who Spun Gold by Virginia Hamilton, illustrated by Leo and Diane Dillon. You know these names. If you've watched any of my other videos on children's books, I am obsessed with this duo. They did her stories. Uh, Leo and Dion, uh, excuse me, Leo and Diane Dillon have done a, a bunch of other amazing amazing award-winning illustrations that are not always in collaboration with Virginia Hamilton, but I am absolutely obsessed with their work. So this is a version of the Rumpelstiltskin story, again, just like Cinderella, the story of a little magical man who either wants to take a woman or take her child in exchange for his magical help and turning in the other story, it's, you know, like straw or hay. In this story, it's spinning thread into gold. Again, there's versions of that story all over the world. This is not just like a West Indies version of Rumpelstiltskin. This is a story of Lit Man Bidian. My West Indies accent is terrible, so I apologize. But this version, look at him. This man is terrifying. He's not a man, but this creature is terrifying. And you probably can't see, but all of these pages have like gold leaf reflection on them. And if you read the illustrator's uh, note in the back of the book, they're like, look, it's really difficult to paint and work with gold leaf, but we knew it was so important because the story was so centered on gold. And one of my favorite things about these illustrations beyond the gold is look at these expressions. Like, you know exactly how she feels. This is Kwashiba. You know exactly how Kwashiba feels when she's sitting there listening to her mother tell a yarn to the old king, talking about, I can spin what? I can do what? Like, oh my gosh, she is loves her mother, but come on now. And one thing I really like about this story is that I feel like in this story, Kwashiba is more of an active protagonist. Yes, she gets you know locked in the dungeons three times, having to spin each whole room into gold. Yes, she has to try to guess the name of Litman, but one of my favorite things about this story is, you know, spoiler alert, if you're unfamiliar, when she finally does guesses the name, she is pissed, rightfully so, at the king. Because not only did he say, oh, you need to spin all of this into gold. If you don't do that, I'm going to lock you and your mother in the dungeon, which is a terrible thing to do, regardless of the fact if the mother lied about whether or not she could spin gold. Like, it, it, I love that this story acknowledges the fact that the king is being kind of an asshole. And so after... The gold has been spun after she guesses Lutman's name and he, oh, I need to show you this illustration. It's absolutely beautiful. And he is so <laughs> angry. He basically like burst into a pop of feathers and flames. Please look at the, the colors. Please look at the movement, the vibrancy. Like this is one of those books that I can just sit and look at the illustrations. After he is sent back once she came, she doesn't speak to the king for three years and she makes him walk up and down fields apologizing over and over for threatening to imprison her and her mother. And after he learns his lesson, three years of silent treatment and miles and miles of asking for forgiveness, she finally does forgive him and they live happily ever after. Now, if that ain't the way a black woman solves relationship problems, and I don't know what is. He truly had no business treating her like an animal, threatening to imprison her mother too, which is, you know, just disrespectful. And if they're gonna have a happy, lasting, healthy relationship after all of this little man and, and you know, spinning gold nonsense, he needs to beg for forgiveness. So I really like that. Um, again, this is a West Indies tale that follows a lot of the similar elements of what you probably know as a German Rumpelstiltskin. But I really appreciate it, again, not only the illustrations, but the fact that this woman, this common woman who becomes queen, Kwashiba, exerts her agency in a very different way. And I like the fact that although the mother does apologize for lying, for <laughs> saying that her daughter could spin yarn into gold, the king also apologizes for his greed and his short-sightedness and threatening to hurt his wife and hurt his wife's mother just for more money. So, the girl who spun gold. Next, let's move over to, I'm gonna say Russia, although I guess it could be Eastern Europe. So this story is called The Snow Princess and it's written and illustrated by Ruth Sanderson. Now they don't actually tell us exactly where this story is set. However, The Snow Princess falls in love with a man named Sergei, which I understand to be a, a Russian or Eastern European name. And when you look at the uh, costumes, I shouldn't say costumes, we look at the clothing, the clothing of the peasants and such, to me, this reads very Eastern European. Now, this story is 
I feel like this is a really great story to talk about the ideas between love and autonomy and love and life because the snow princess is the daughter of mother spring and father frost so she's an immortal nature-based being and she's raised in a beautiful loving home she has the ability to you know bring the flurries and the snow and the wind these this is a gorgeous uh illustration of her mother spring and her father frost and her as a little girl but when she grows up she tells her parents i want to explore the world i want to see what else is out there i've lived here my entire life and surprisingly to me because this is a fairy tale they say okay you are an adult go out live your life but you cannot fall in love because if you fall in love you will die so she spends years wandering the world watching humans, trying to understand them, interacting with polar bears and, and snow hawks and rabbits. And she ends up falling in love with a man named Sergei. And now while she's in the process of falling in love with him, her father, Father Frost, comes to her in dreams, warning her, angrily yelling at her, you need to freeze your heart. You need to push him from your mind. If you fall in love with this man, you will die. So she really does try to separate herself from him, to leave the village, not interact with him anymore after all these many months of getting to know him. But eventually she's drawn back when she finds out that he is lost and hurt in a storm that she herself caused. When she found him again, she realized that even if it meant she was going to die, she couldn't deny the fact that she loved him and she was glad to be with him. But interestingly enough, after she accepted the fact that she was going to die, her mother, Mother Spring, appeared to her and when she talked to her mother and said, I don't understand, I, I feel wonderful, I feel warm, my skin is pink, like how can I be about to die? Her mother explains to her that by falling in love with a human, she has become mortal. And like all mortals, she will grow old and die. So it wasn't that her father necessarily lied to her because falling in love will lead to her death, but falling in love doesn't lead to her immediate death. And I think it's interesting that the father was the one warning her the entire book about not falling in love. And it's the mother who gives her the entire truth that since you fall in love with this man, yes, you get to spend the rest of your life with him, but that life will be over in several decades. I really, really like this story, if you couldn't tell, because there's so many princess stories, there's so many fairy tales about like sacrificing your life for a man. But that sacrifice is very immediate, which in my mind pisses me off. Like when I think about like, oh my gosh, you know, that version of the Little Mermaid in which she's just going to turn into foam bubbles on the sea because her love rejects her. I'm like, girl, it's this is your life. Live your life. But in this version, it's she is choosing a life of companionship that will be shorter as opposed to a life of immortality in which she only has her parents and i'm not saying that you should choose your romantic partner over your parents and i'm not saying that living your entire life with only the love of your parents is in any way invalid but i appreciated the fact that this was a story in which a parent did not tell their child the, the entire truth and therefore didn't really give her the agency even though they were physically letting her leave their home to make the most informed decision for herself. In the end, she chose to go back and find Sergei dying in the storm, knowing that if she saw him again, it, met, it would mean her immediate death because she loved him. And that's a choice she made. But I feel like, again, the story would have been different, but I feel like it would have been even more loving of her parents. And I'm glad her mother, her mother Spring, did that in the end. If they explain that what we're really trying to protect you from is a life of mortality because it means that one day we will lose you, which of course is a parent's absolute worst nightmare. So I really love this story because it feels like it gives you, and I imagine it would give you and your kids, a lot of opportunities to talk about the whole truth versus a partial truth, the love of a parent versus the love of a romantic partner, the idea of selfless, lo selfless love, because if she hadn't gone back to find Sergei, he would have died, but she would have gone on without truly falling in love with him, the pros and cons of that. And Ruth Sam Anderson is an OG of fairy tales, folk tales, children's stories. If you have not heard of her or her work, I would absolutely recommend checking her out. Now, moving away from a story that's specifically rooted in a culture just to a princess story I adore because it's unique is Princess Hyacinth, The Surprising Tale of the Girl Who Floated. So this is a story of a young girl who floats. Nobody knows why, nobody can fix it. And so she lives a life trapped in the palace because it'd be too dangerous if she went outside, she would fly away. And she always wears these big, heavy jewels and and, uh, ro and uh, royal robes, except when she's sleeping, in order to weigh her little body down. One thing I love about the story is that the text itself is part of the illustration process. This, As you can see, there's different colors, 
when different people are speaking, when the colors match the color scheme used in the illustration. You can see here they're weighing her down with all her heavy clothes. And I love the fact that, again, this is a story about parents who are trying to protect their child. But eventually, as all children do, <laughs> mistakes happen. She rebels and she ends up floating away into the sky. But she's not afraid because the first time, for the first time in her life, she's free. And she ends up being saved by a young boy who used to come to play outside the palace and would compliment her crown and who maybe has a little crush on her because he flew his kite up next to her, which got her tangled up and allowed him to pull her down. And from that day on, she was never bored again because she had all these opportunities to fly and swoop and soar. And her friend, the boy with the kite, was always there to bring her back down again. I think this story is super creative, really unique. I love the illustration style. It's something that I'm not familiar with. And this is my first time reading a book by Florence Perry Hyde, who unfortunately has passed, or illustrated by Lane Smith. I just absolutely adore this style. And one of the last lines of the book is that Princess Hyacinth or her family, they never found a way to cure her floating. But it wasn't about the fact that they had to find a way to cure her floating. It was more about the fact that friendship and trust and learning to let go and creative problem solving meant that she had a fun, beautiful, fulfilling life now. And she didn't have to spend all her life trapped under heavy, ro heavy robes and big heavy crowns and strapped down to chairs and never allowed to go outside and be a kid. So although it wasn't a, a very like, on your nose after school special be yourself it'll all be okay because there was a real danger to her floating away up into the sky and never being seen or heard from again but i love that this story talks about hey she's never going to have a normal childhood like everybody else she's never going to be like everybody else but that doesn't mean she can't still have fun and have friends and her parents can't learn to balance their love for her and their desire to protect her with the ability to let her go and explore and play so you know these characters the main characters are white there are diversity in them in the supporting cast in the story so i can't really speak to whether this is an american princess or european princess but i really wanted to include it because it's, it's a unique princess story and unlike the rest of these in this stack it's not a story that's based of a folk tale that's hundreds or thousands of years old as far as i know if you know if prince if, if princess hyacinth is based off another folk tale about a, a girl who floats please tell me so i would love to find out um where that came from and how it ended up in this book moving into to, or I guess I say back into Eastern European land, we have the Frog Princess, Frog Princess, excuse me, retold by J. Patrick Lewis, paintings by Gennady Spirin. I apologize. This person, this illustrator is Russian. He immigrated to the United States. He did all the illustrations for this book. And I apologize for not being able to pronounce your name. Uh, I absolutely adore your work, sir, if you are watching this. Uh, this is probably one of my most favorite illustrated books because look at this decadence. Look at this detail. This absolute, the, the, the strands of her hair, the feathers of her handmaidens, excuse me, her night maidens. I love that every single page has this gorgeous, like, brocade baroque border that speaks to the decadence and opulence of this empire um again i feel confident in saying that this is a russian a russian interpretation of the tale because everyone's names are ivan and and, Ser and sergey and vasilisa also i mean you look at their traditional clothes their costumes their head coverings their jewels the type of food that they eat at the banquet and again the ethnicity of the illustrator leads me to believe these things i absolutely adore this story because it combines multiple uh stories you actually have like a you have a baba yaga appearance with her house on chicken legs which as far as as I know, I've never seen her in a story that wasn't specifically about her. You have the classic trope of the man who's in love with the woman under a curse and has to go on this great journey to free her from an evil sorcerer who has to use the help of animals such as pikes and bears and, and hawks in order to break a spell that would allow him to kill the evil sorcerer. And of course, you have the classic story of not judging a book by its cover. In this version of the story, unlike the uh, Disney version with Tiana that I also love, all three princes of the great czar had to shoot an arrow as far as they could and whoever found their arrow would be their bride. So two brothers had their arrows found by women and the third brother 
had his arrow found by a frog. And of course he's devastated and humiliated, but the Tsar is like, hey, rules the rules, you gotta marry this frog. But the way he learns that his frog wife is actually Vasilisa the Wise, a beautiful, kind, magic woman, as you can see right here, making swans in a lake appear on the dance floor, is that the Tsar decides to have a competition. He requests that all of his daughter-in-laws make a robe, make a tart, do these things to prove their skill and their cunning and their uh, and their craft, and she wins every time. But unfortunately, men being impatient as they are, the prince Ivan, he burned her frog skin when she was in her human form, thereby condemning her to spend even more years cursed as a frog, which is why he has to go on this great journey. Um, I do really enjoy the retelling of the story. It's very fluid and descriptive, but I cannot get over the illustrations. I, I simply can't. Like this book would have been equally as good if this illustrator didn't take the time to illustrate every single thing around the text in addition to the pictures, but it just adds a whole other layer to it. I mean, look, look at this robe. Look at the detail on this robe. I can't even imagine painting all of this or creating all this by hand. And for anybody who has heard jokes about white people not having culture, we weren't talking about Russians. We weren't, we weren't talking about Europeans. We were talking about some other folks. Um, <laughs> moving on to perhaps the most, to finish with the most, I want to say controversial choice that I have here because it, it gets me in the feels is The Invisible Princess by Faith Ringgold. This is another story that as far as I know is unique to this book. It is not based on another princess story. And Faith Ringgold is an amazing, amazing um, artist and activist. I've seen her work in museums in Atlanta, which is why I wanted to pick this up. In this story, The Invisible Princess is born to two enslaved people, Mama Love and Papa Love, and they don't want Want her to be taken by their evil slave master so they pray to the goddess of peace that she will come and protect the invisible princess and she does this this young girl is raised by goddesses and queens of nature of the prince of dark and the lady of peace and the queen of bees they all protect her and grow her and teach her because one day she will lead all the slaves of this plantation to freedom now what eventually ends up happening is that prophecy is confirmed it is fulfilled the princess is not captured by the evil slave master she is protected by all the gods and goddesses of nature that raise her and everyone in their village ascends to heaven or a heaven-like place where they can live in peace and love and harmony that is all well and good <laughs> and i think it's a lovely story what challenges me is that in addition to all of those people going the slave master's daughter who was born blind gets to go as well. And the slave master here, after spending years without his daughter, angry and upset, repents for his sins and asks to be taken to the village of peace, hope and love as well. And he is, he is forgiven. The lady of peace brings him up to their village. And the story ends with this really beautiful hymn of we live in a peaceful village of freedom and love and harmony with our brothers and sisters by all the stars above. We live in a beautiful village full of happiness and joy dedicated to the freedom of every man, woman, girl, and boy. So you see the invisible princess here, all of the enslaved peoples that she has liberated, the slave master's daughter and the slave master. The slave master's wife is not here because she died on the night of the invisible princess's birth. And Faith Ringgold is a black woman, so context for this story here. But what I find so challenging about this is that although I do believe that people can change and I do that pe believe that people are worthy of redemption, it's very hard for me. It was very hard for me to read this book initially and then read it since and think about offering a powerful, cruel, manipulative man, such as a slave master, forgiveness. And it made me wonder, would he really have wanted forgiveness? Would he really have wanted to change his ways if he had not been put in a situation where he basically had no choice? All of the people that he had owned and abused were gone. His only daughter was gone, the only person he ever loved. Loved, and it was in those circumstances that he asked for redemption. It's a fictional children's book, and I understand that perhaps I'm reading too much into it, but like if I had kids, I don't know if I would read this to them because I don't know if I believe that, frankly. I don't know if when I think of a place of peace, hope, and love, a place of liberation, a place of you know wonder and magic, that I would want the same people, specifically in this context, the same racist, hateful, abusive white people who made my earthly life and the earthly lives of the people around me such hell, redeemed like to spend eternity 
in a place of love and kindness after everything they've done before. And that gets into some <laughs> Christian theology, that gets into some tabula rasa, that gets into a lot of bigger themes that perhaps are not meant to be discussed in like a 30 minute story time with your child. But I did want to include this book because I thought the story was profound. I thought it was challenging. I thought the illustrations were beautiful. This is Faith's like signature style. And it got me thinking, which is, that's what books are for. They make you feel and they make you think. So while I'm still processing whether or not I appreciate or like the fact that the slave master was redeemed in the end and got to go to this beautiful village of peace and forgiveness, I do think it does make it a better story and a more compelling story. So with all that being said, those are some of my favorite princess stories from around the world. Oh, I should have mentioned Invisible Princess was a, oops, Invisible Princess was set in the American South, of course, during times of chattel slavery. Even if you are a fan of some of the Disney stories like I am, I love A Princess and the Frog. I know Mulan is problematic as hell, but she was my first Disney princess of color. I know that I am not uh, East Asian, but long before we had Tiana, I was like, that one, that one's strong and smart and she's not white and she has black hair that one is gonna be my representative. But I would really encourage you to explore some of these other stories. And especially if you have a young child in your life who loves the idea of the princess narrative, try switching it up a bit. Try using this as an opportunity to explore Russian and Persian and African-American culture. I think as always, children's books are such a fantastic avenue to learn something new, to be introduced to new concepts, and as a starting point, a conversation point for all of these different types of themes, whether they are anti-monarchy, whether they are about um, good nature versus good deeds, whether they're about forgiveness for slave masters. I think there's a lot here. So with that being said, I hope you have a good one and I am glad to be back <laughs> because it has been a minute because grad school. <laughs> okay, bye.